joining us today. My name is Joni Chase and I work for the Kenton Medway Progression Federation. I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar all about applying for disabled students allowance. The presentation will be led by Emily Watson and Norma Kitson from Iona Kent and Southeast, an independent organisation for needs assessment. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Emily Watson and let's get started with the presentation. Okay, so first of all, we'll look at the application process um, and consider the funding bodies. So there are a number of funding bodies that provide um, finance to students and um, finance for the DSA. Um, the one that most students will be financed by is Student Finance, and that's Student Finance England, Wales, Northern Ireland, and this includes the undergraduate uh, social work bursary. In addition, there are other funding bodies such as the NHS and they will fund postgraduate um, social work students and there are research councils who will fund, uh, for example, students who are doing postgraduate um, studies at doctorials. Okay, um, so for this presentation, we will consider Student Finance England um, as the majority of students apply to SFE. Um, students can apply for DSA as soon as the student finance application opens and this is spring. Uh, this year it opened on the 1st of March and the first student came to us for their needs assessment um, the day afterwards um, and we encourage students to apply as soon as possible because then it's more likely that they will have everything they need ready for the start of their course. Uh, so full-time undergraduate students who are applying for other student finance, such as the tuition fee loan, will be able to apply for DSA from their online account after they have submitted their main student finance application. And if they're applying for other student finance, they will be asked on their main application if they want to apply for DSA. So if students are only applying for DSA and no other type of student finance or are a new part-time student or a postgraduate student, they need to complete a DSA-1 application form and they can download that from the uh, government website, the student finance section. Um, there is a link at the end of this presentation um, and they will download that and complete it once the service opens and that is later on uh, towards the summer. So they need to complete that and return that to student finance. So now look at the eligibility um, for the application. So the Equality Act 2010 defines disability as a physical or mental impairment that has a substantial and long-term effect on a per person's ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. Okay, so in terms of... Um, of the DSA that is an effect on um, the, their studies and disabilities include like physical disability, a long-term health condition, a sensory impairment which affects sight or hearing, mental health conditions such as anxiety or depression, a specific learning difficulties such as dyslexia or dyspraxia and also uh, attention deficit disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or autism spectrum conditions. Then there are other aspects of eligibility that should be considered. Um, so the student has to be on an eligible full or part-time undergraduate UK course or a postgraduate course and this includes courses at the Open University or distance learning. Um, so I've got a list of the different courses that it covers. So a degree for example a BA, BSc or BEd a foundation degree, a certificate of higher education, a diploma of higher education, a DIP HE, a higher national certificate, HNC, a higher national diploma, HND, postgraduate certificate of education, PGCE, or initial teacher training. So the majority of students that we assess will be at um, university on one of those higher level courses, but we do get students, for example, from Canterbury College on HNCs and HNDs. Uh, students can check with their university or college if their course is eligible. They can do this either when they're applying, before they apply, or 
um, once they are on their course. Previous study does not affect eligibility for DSA, even if the student got financial support. Um, and you may see advice that student does not have to pay back anything from their DSA, but if a student got DSA for any specialist equipment for a previous course, it will be taken into account at the needs assessment. So the DSA is not available to students getting support equivalent to the DSA from another funding course, for example, their university or social work bursary. Uh, it's also not available to EU students or overseas students or students getting funding from the NHS or the Research Council, as I um, discussed earlier. Also, it's not available to students on sandwich courses or full year placements. However, students may still be able to get DSA if they are doing certain types of unpaid work experience in the public sector or voluntary sector. So if a student does not qualify for DSA during their placement year, they may be able to get help from another scheme, which is called the Access to Work Scheme. And again, I've got a link for that at the end of the presentation. Um, further, students cannot get DSA for more than one course at, at the same time. Um, if they're studying abroad, they may be eligible for DSA whilst attending an overseas university or college as part of the UK course. We recently had a student who inquired if they would be able to get the DSA if they were studying in America. Uh, we looked into it and we advised them we did not think so um, but it'd be best to check with SFE um, and they were happy to do that we would have done it on their behalf. Um, there is no age limit on getting DSAs and it is not related to household income. And, um, one of the things I'll say about the application at this point which I go on to later is there's the option to give consent to share at the application stage. And what this means is that uh, the students would give consent for SFE to discuss their DSA with the assessment centre like Iona. And, and that can help us liaise with SFE on behalf of the student. So moving on to evidence. So when students apply for DSA, they will be told what evidence they need to send to SFE to support their application. So all students will be asked to provide evidence of their disability and students can submit a digital copy of their evidence through their online account. So we uh, look at medical evidence. So students with physical disabilities, long-term health or mental health conditions can provide a letter, a medical report or a written medical statement from a doctor or a qualified specialist confirming the disability or condition and how it will affect the student's ability to study. SFE do have a disabled students allowance evidence form that a medical professional, for example, the GP, can complete to provide information about the student's disability. Uh, the student cannot reclaim any charge from completing this form via DSA and so SFE asks that it is provided free of charge and if we were advising students about getting medical evidence we would advise them to use this form because it has all the criteria on it already and all the doctor has to do is put the student's name, uh, the diagnosis and then sign and date it. Um, and then we will also advise the student to let the GP know that they are expected to provide it free of charge because it, otherwise there is a barrier there for the student if they're expected to pay for it. Because we do have some students that will say the doctor's charging, for example, £25 and that's prohibitively expensive. Um, OK, uh, so just to recap on that, the student's evidence should demonstrate that they have a physical, sensory or mental disability, which is a substantial, more than minor or trivial, and long-term adverse effect on their ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. And that includes education, as I said earlier. Um, and to be considered long-term, the effect of the disability must have lasted or be likely to last at least 12 months or for the rest of the student's life. So students are advised to keep a copy of their evidence, um, such as the DSA disability evidence form for their own records. So they don't need to send the original evidence and it does cause problems sometimes if they do, you know, if it got mislaid in the post. Um, and they, as I'll say later, they also provide a copy to um, 
as Iona, um, so we can consider it in their needs assessment. So the student could email the evidence and the form to the DSA team, or they can post it, um, or they can come to us and we can send it to Student Finance England on their behalf. So if we go on now to students with a specific learning difficulty, they must provide a diagnostic report which is carried out by a chartered or practitioner psychologist or a suitably qualified teacher holding a current assessment practicing certificate. Uh, it's very important that this evidence covers all the criteria required by Student Finance England. We have had students that have had um, assessments that don't cover all the criteria. So if anybody wanted to come to us, we could provide them advice. We are in contact with local diagnosticians. Um, so we can help with that. Uh, students do have to pay for any tests they need to prove that they're able to get the DSA. Um, but if a student needs a test but can't afford to pay for it, um, it is quite difficult before they go to university, but if they're already at college or at university, they may be able to get financial help from their university or college. Uh, but again, this is something um, in terms of individual students who can come to us and we can provide some advice. Okay, we just have um, a video now. It's the DSA video from SFV. This is Rachel. She's going into her second year at uni. Last year, Rachel applied for Disabled Students Allowance as she has dyslexia. She got help to cover specialist reading software to support her through her course. The extra funding Rachel got will not have to be paid back when she's left uni. Visit our Disabled Students Allowance page on gov.uk for more information on what you can get and how to apply. Okay, so um, moving on, I'll now consider the study needs assessment. So once SFE have reviewed the student's application form and supporting evidence and confirm the student is eligible for DSAs, they will ask them to book a study needs assessment and the student should not do this until SFE has told them to. And the student should book this assessment as soon as possible. Uh, the cost of the study needs assessment is paid by SFE directly to the assessment centre like Iona through the DSA. Um, and the DSA one letter directs the student to find their nearest approved study needs assessment. Um, and Iona, we've got our main office is in Canterbury, we're also in Medway and Greenwich, so it's likely that we will be the local centre uh, for students in Kent and South East. Um, so the study needs assessment is an informal meeting with an experienced independent needs assessor and its purpose is to discuss what type of disability related equipment and support can be provided to help the students during their time at university or college and I will stress it's not a test it's the student's chance to have an informal chat with a specialist trained advisor about their disability and the impact it has on their studies during the study needs assessment the assessor will work out what the student needs to get them to help and get the most from their time at university or college. And again, I will reiterate about it not being a test. Um, some students can be put off, particularly if they have been through the diagnostic assessment, which can be a lengthy process, up to three hours, and does have elements of test in it. Um, also, if students have been through the PIP process. So we do reassure students that it is not a test, that it is an informal discussion. So before the assessment, when the student contacts us, we will ask them to provide us with the DSA1 letter from student finance to show their eligibility. We will also ask them to provide the evidence um, as this will provide um, uh, help justifying the recommendations in the report. So it will be referenced in the report. 
And also we are required and ask students to complete pre-assessment form. So it's the students um, chance to provide relevant information before the assessment that the assessor can consider in preparation. And it also provides important information about the student's equipment, uh, where they're studying, what course they're studying. So all these considerations can be made in advance of the assessment. We do find sometimes this pre-assessment form can delay students um, progressing with the needs assessment. So we will contact them and see if we can uh, help them with it. We do help them complete it over the phone also. So if any student had any concern about providing any information, they can contact us and we can talk them through it. Uh, so student, uh, sorry, I'll just move back a minute. So uh, students finance England will only pay for one needs assessment, uh, but the student can be reassessed at a later date if their needs change significantly. Uh, for example, if they have a break in studies, they have a new condition to be considered, or they uh, move to a particular type of course. Uh, the students can also have their travel costs to the assessment reimbursed by Student Finance England. So we would advise the student of this at the needs assessment. So if they kept the, their receipts, they could be sent to Student Finance England for reimbursement. So now if we think about the needs assessment report, I've got the actual wording from the report, which advises how it should be completed. Um, I will go on to talk about this a bit more um, to give some examples. So the remit of the needs assessment report is to identify the additional expenditure that the student is obliged to incur in order to attend a designated HE course because of a disability or specific learning difficulty. So all recommend recommendations made within the report must be in respect of expenditure not covered elsewhere in the student support regulations and arise from attending or undertaking the course as well as from the disability or specific learning difficulty. So recommendations must not be made for disability or specific learning difficulty related expenditure which the student would incur irrespective of whether or not they are disabled. I'll give some examples later on or also any course related costs that the student might incur or expenditure related to equipment or services which might reasonably be expected to be provided by the institution under other legislation such as the Equality Act 2010. So again I'll give some examples in a moment. So the needs assessment report is divided into sections the assessor will discuss each of these sections with a student and they will consider the impact of the student's disability in these areas. Um, so it's research and reading, writing and reviewing academic work, note taking in lectures and seminars, managing time and organising work and access to and use of technology. And then continuing, there's also practical sessions, placements, field trips, examinations and timed assessments social interaction and communication, travel and access to the higher education environment. And that includes two uh, placements. Um, sorry, I'll just go back a minute. So the, in, like I said, in each section, it covers the impacts. And then there's a section where the assessor's making recommendations that will address those impacts and we'll look at those in more detail in a moment. So, so post assessment, following the study needs assessment, the assessment centre will send the report detailing the student's needs and the assessment centre's recommendations for specialist equipment and or support to the funding body, so like SFE. And if SFE ask a student to attend an assessment and they do not receive the report, they will contact the student to remind them. But after the report is received by SFE from the assessment centre, they will review what they recommend and make their final decision to confirm what specialist equipment and other support the DSA can pay for in a DSA entitlement letter, which is called the DSA 2. They will also give instructions for ordering any specialist equipment or arranging other support. 
Once a student receives the entitlement letter, they should check it carefully because it will tell them what DSA they are entitled to and what they can use them for. And the student can then start to buy the items, order the equipment, arrange the specialist service details. If the student does this before getting their entitlement letter, SFE will not be able to reimburse the student for these costs. Uh, SFE will contact the student and um, if they have given their consent, the disability advisor and needs assessor to let them know if funding has been approved. So if the student has any questions about the report, they should contact um, like the assessment centre like Iona. Um, so again, there it's very useful if the student does provide the consent to share with the assessment centre and with their disability advisor, because both can provide support to um, put in um, the recommendations from the report to put that support into place. Uh, so quite a lot of the time, this stage of the process will be held up. Um, student might not receive the letter, it might go to their junk folder of their inbox, um, of, of their um, email account, or they may, even if they've been advised, they may assume that they're going to receive the equipment and they don't have to do anything and they do need to contact the suppliers uh, themselves to put that in place. Um, so we will, if we receive a copy of the DSA too, we will contact the student um, to advise them that they have the letter and what the next stages are and that if they need any support, we can um, help them with that. Um, now we'll look at the um, support, so this is like the arranged support section. So the allowance is divided up into different sections. So the first one we'll look at is the non-medical help allowance. Um, so the DSAs provide support for study through this non-medical help allowance. And this is a person to support the student. And on the screen I've put, these are the three most common that are recommended. So the specialist mentor that would help students with uh, mental health conditions and the specialist one-to-one -one study skill support uh, provided to students with SPLDs and then the assistive technology trainer will train the student in the assistive technology they receive and the software which we'll look at in a moment. So the non-medical helper is a person to support the student such as a support worker and other non-medical assistance a student may need to use to benefit fully from their course. So the type of non-medical help a student will get will depend on individual needs, but the support worker should have a good understanding of the support student needs and be reliable and trustworthy. And to get the most effective help possible from a support worker, a student should let them know if they have any specific requirements. For example, if they have a note taker, they should let them know what font and text size is best and the students should provide a copy of their timetable and let them know if any class times or rooms change. Um, so what we here, do here at Iona is we'll put in as much information as we can that would um, provide the um, non-medical helper with a background about the student that they can consider when they're providing the support. So there are lots of other non-medical helper um, available um, to recommend and these, the ones here on the screen are for more what are called like high impact, um, low frequency disabilities. So uh, these ones are grouped under specialist enabling support like uh, sighted guide, communication support workers and lip speakers, specialist note takers for deaf and visually impaired students electronic note taker, speech to text reporting and mobility trainer. And then continuing, there's also specialist access helpers, so British Sign Language interpreter, and then specialist support professionals for students with sensory impairments, deaf or hard of hearing students, students with visual impairment, and for students with multi-sensory impairments. Right, so another 
aspect of the allowance is the specialist equipment allowance. So if particular software, for example, text-to-speech software is recommended, it needs um, the laptop, to, a computer to be of a certain specification to run that software. So if the student does not have a computer or their computer does not meet that specification for the recommended student uh, uh, software, they can have the laptop recommended for them. Uh, so students applying for DSA for the first time or starting a new period of study have to make a contribution of £200 towards the cost of a computer. That's recognising that all students are required to buy a laptop um, and then £200 is the minimum cost. The DSAs can also pay for repairs, technical support, insurance and extended warranty costs arising from owning that equipment. Um, and as I said earlier, the advice might be that students don't have to pay back anything from the DSAs, but SFE do advise if students purchase equipment before starting their course and fail to attend, they will need to pay or return the equipment. Um, so on the screen, I put the most common uh, kinds of software that we recommend. There are lots of different strategies that can be recommended but these are the most common and the most common disability that is assessed is dyslexia and these are likely to be recommended to students with dyslexia but they're also recommended for students with other disabilities um, for example mental health conditions. I have included three links on this slide. Um, there are a number of different software providers that provide the software that uh, gives the student these strategies but I have just linked to um, an example for each and if we take a look at the text-to-speech link I've got here hopefully now you can see it's not what um let me move down the screen that's it hopefully you can see the website sorry we can emily it's working yeah i think it's just um it's also got other bits of my screen on it which i'm not quite sure but why um i'm just going to check if i've got the right yeah i should have the right one so Can you see, sorry, can you see the, um, something from Outlook in front of it as well? No, we can no, just see. Okay, so I can see it, sorry, it just distracted me, so if you can't see it, that's fine. So, Text Help Read and Write is the uh, text-to-speech software. So there is another software company called uh, Claro Read that provides it as well. And when we uh, make the recommendations, we will, look at what the university provides because they could also provide support for the students so uh, if we just take a look if I'm just going to scroll down this screen to get so you can get a sort of an overview of uh, the support it provides a bit further down it summarizes it and there's also maybe interest to some of you who are attending that they do provide this free for um, staff in primary and secondary schools. If we look here, so as I said, it's text-to-speech software, so it will read what is on the screen to a student. Um, and it has other useful aspects, like it, you can do um, colour highlighting, so if students prefer to uh, read with a tint, you can uh, put that on the screen. It has uh, dictionary functions and vocabulary lists, and this also has um, speech to text on the uh, talk type there. Um, so um, I just think for some examples of when this is useful to um, students. Um, so, so it can help students if they're, they're reading on screen, they can listen at the same time or they may, may need a break from the screen so they can have it continuing to read to them. Um, 
so I think that sort of a, a, gives them a, a introduction to that. Um, but if you're interested in any of this kind of software, you can contact us and we can give you some advice on that. So if I go back to presentation. And then another aspect of the allowance is the travel allowance. So to help with the extra travel costs, a student may have to pay to attend their university or college because of their disability. For example, if a student has to take a taxi because their disability prevents them from taking public transport. Um, students are not eligible for help with everyday travel costs, which any student would expect to pay. Um, and they may have to provide receipts. Full and part-time students can get reasonable spending on travel costs. The money is paid directly to the supplier of the service, for example, the taxi firm. Um, so if I just recap, so if a student has a taxi allowance because they have a mob um, mobility disability, um, they would have to pay the taxi company the public transport cost of that journey. And then the rest of the cost of the taxi is paid directly uh, to the taxi company from Student Finance England. And then the, there's also the general allowance. So this is to pay for other disability and course related costs of studying that a student may have as a direct result of their disability. Um, and as I said earlier, like student attends the study needs assessment, they can also pay for their um, travel costs and it covers the assessment fee. So SFE will pay us directly um, for that. Um, it's got living accommodation on there. That is actually very rare. Um, and there's also consumables and the need for the consumables has to be evidenced as a student would be expected to use the assistive, assistive software. And one of the remits of the DSAs is to make students as independent as possible and assistive software is um, very useful for doing that. Um, go on to the next slide. It shows um, the DSA allowance for next academic year is up to £25,000 per year for each student. This is the maximum available and is aimed at supporting students with a high level of need. So most students will get less. And the money will be paid directly to the supply of the service, for example, the university, college or support agency. Uh, the specialist equipment, the non-medical helpers, the travel costs or the course related costs. So the amount the student gets will depend on their individual needs and it has to be um, evidence why those costs should be incurred. Okay, uh, go on now, just got a couple of links at the end of here. So the first one will take you to the government web website for the DSA with information on eligibility and how to apply. And they've also included a link to access to work. So it's a similar scheme for um, people in employment. Um, so that's it for me. And then next bit is some um, questions and the slide with our contact, contact details. So please do contact us um, at any time you'd like for any further information or particular advice relating to individual students. Thank you so much, Emily. That was a really sort of clear and comprehensive overview um, of the process. Um, before we do go into questions, I think it's worth saying, um, A, that there's a lot of information to take in. And I guess sometimes it's only going through that process that you begin to understand all the different steps that you talked about. Um, but also, I think we're all very aware that no two students' needs are the same. Um, so a lot, a lot of the questions and answers may be personal um, or, or be depend on different per people's situations. So I'm really glad that we've got Norma with us now as well. Um, so uh, there are some questions coming in the chat already, which is fantastic. Let me have a little look. Um, so one says that Emily mentioned that universities provide some support for the students. How can I find out what support my chosen university can provide me before I start the course? I would say the most 
direct route is to contact the disability team who will put you in touch with one of the disability advisors. Every, every university has a different policy for what's called reasonable adjustments. And that's what a student would need to talk to the disability advisor about, that for the university they've chosen to go to, what are the reasonable adjustments that can be put in place for them? It's, it's very important that the student does actually make a note of what their concerns are, but also before asking has a good idea of, of what the DSA will cover. So again, as Emily said throughout, probably the first step is to contact us and we can talk you through what we feel the DSA will cover in, in each student's case. What it doesn't cover, we can then advise them to, to make a note of that and contact the disability advisor. Does that answer the question? I think it does answer the question. The other thing that I was going to say is that the terminology in HE can be quite um, either misleading or different in different universities as well. Mm -hmm. So back when I started working in 2002, it was a disability unit at the university. Much more frequently now, you will have wellbeing services and wellbeing centres. Yeah. Um, and if I get a chance, I can put those for our local universities and contacts in the chat. Um, if not, there's also, you can email sendpp at kent.ac.uk. I'll put that in the chat at any point and we can in introduce you to the people or the departments that can help. Um, because I think it's also probably worth pointing out that obviously this process is very much based on the medical model of disability um, and the needs, whereas lots of the universities are trying by design to be much more inclusive and accessible. Mm. And I think your question about finding that out, ask the wellbeing services, you know, do they have captions in lectures as part of their programme? Um, so, yeah, just reiterating what Norma said. Um, just looking at the chat, um, bear with me, sorry. Um, someone's asked if we can uh, have the links mentioned in the previous slide so I can write them down, please. Absolutely. Um, I will do that in a moment. Um, there is also in the chat the presentation itself. Um, Kat's just added that in there. Um, and the links, you can, you can open the presentation and go directly from all of the links as well. Um, there's one from a parent here that says, my son has a diagnosis of dyslexia and dyscalculia. We have been told he needs an updated assessment by an educational psychologist. Is this needed for the DSA? It, it would definitely be needed for the DSA. If, if the student waits to start their course, a lot of universities will contribute to the funding for this assessment. But the problem is, and it could be quite a barrier, that they have to wait until they join, then the referral is made, they wait for the appointment, wait for the report. So it could be quite a few months before, before they actually start getting support because there is quite a, a waiting list in, in the booking system, the writing up the report and the, the approval by Student Finance England. I would, wherever possible, say, do try and have this done beforehand. And we do work with a lot of educational psychologists as well as specialist teachers who we can advise any, any parent or student of their contact details, it's up to them to, just to decide which one to go for. But again, we'd say, if you do select somebody on, on the list of people that we know are local, do find out how soon they can have an appointment, how long it will take for the report to be written up, and how long it will take for them to receive it. Because that, again, they might have a, an appointment free in a couple of weeks, but it might take a lot longer to write up the report. So again, it's looking at those delays. And again, it's actually talking it through with, with somebody who knows the scenario and that's what we're there for. Um, does that answer the parent's question? If it doesn't, I'm very happy to say more. Sorry, I've done the age old trick and muted myself so you couldn't hear me. <laughs> um, Yes, I think so. If not, please do continue to put those questions in. And as Norma said, I think that being in touch with um, Iona and the, the support available, um, the contact details are still still on the screen. Um, there is a question from somebody that says, I have a full time, ooh, I've just lost, sorry, bear with me, I'm trying to scroll down. 
I have a full time learning support assistant for mobility and health and for helping lessons. Will I be able to still access this at university? Again, this is what's known as a reasonable adjustment because anything in what's called band three and four is usually covered by the DSA, apart from certain things as, such as a cited guide. But there are um, band one and two practical assistance, which is what this person is talking about. And yes, that would be arranged because anything that disadvantages the student from, from an equal access to learning has to be obviously looked at by the university by a reasonable adjustments or in exceptional cases, we can apply for funding on their behalf through the DSA. Again, it's a case by case study and it'll, it's all depending on what funding is available through the, the university and what key, can be considered an exceptional case and be funded through the DSA. Does that Brilliant. answer? Yes, thank you. Um, I was just checking, um, and Kat said she's loaded the presentation, which I've already mentioned. Um, there was a question about how, how have assessments change in light of the pandemic? So if someone was coming to you now um, for an assessment, would they uh, that be done virtually or in person at the moment? Well, it's still it's st it can still be done remotely. We haven't it hasn't been confirmed yet to go back to face to face. You haven't heard anything, have you, Emily? No. So sorry, did you need to say something on that one? No. Okay. So we still do them remotely, and that can be by video, by phone call anything that suits the student. Um, obviously Zoom or another platform is ideal because then we can demonstrate the software, but we've managed it quite well. And that's the needs assessment. As regarding the diagnostic assessment, that's, that's actually another aspect which has changed quite a lot, but I don't know if that's part of the question. That's great, thank you. Um, there's a, a, another question here about if a student is unable to talk about their disability to the assessor, are they allowed to have a carer or guardian with them to help them with the assessment? Yes, well, well as, as an independent assessment centre, we all have different policies, obviously, but I would be very surprised if anybody refused that because it, it obviously is a great help and support to the student and also to the needs assessor, because often the student won't won't explain as much as say a parent or uh, a mentor who's accompanying them will be able to do um, so yes we would welcome it as, particularly if it's in, in support of the student yeah and we do um ask the student for consent to discuss yes. um their needs assessment with us and we do have a lot of discussions with parents um and also we will ask the student how they prefer to be contacted. So um, we can, obviously you have to have the needs assessment um, appointment itself, but we can liaise with a student via email and they can provide information if that's their preferred way of communicating with us. I think a combination sometimes yeah. is, is, be is best for most students. So we, just by email isn't ideal, yeah. but Obviously, in some cases, that's much preferred. But as Emily said, as long as we have a brief email giving the consent of the student to liaise with whoever, whatever person they name, that, that's fine. That's fine because it's in their interest, obviously. Great, thank you. We're having a bit of an issue um, with um, not all attendees or guests being able to see the, the um, presentation which Kat Patriona Jameson has put in the chat um, so I can see it um, and I it literally comes up as an icon that says applying for disabled students allowance and there's a little blue arrow that you click on to be able to download it um, it might be useful is there anybody um, else get that a guess or participants that can say whether they can can see the presentation if we just put yes that will help us know or perhaps Pat um, we've got everyone's email uh, emails from signing up to the webinar so we can also send it out um, when we've finished as well so you've got mm -hmm. access to it with those links. 
me just see, we've got some more questions. Yeah, yes, no, no afraid not, no, I don't think so, which is exceptionally peculiar, but technology has not been our friend this week. Um, so, we're, so we are glad that we can actually get here. So what we will do as a solution um, is, as Kat's just said, she'll forward it to everyone and apologies for those who you can't, who can't see it. Um, let me just see if there are any other chats, that, questions that have come in. Yes, someone who's more IT savvy than us has suggested that perhaps it's an issue with the web browser rather than the Zoom application, um, which so I think maybe if you're using uh, one platform or maybe need to use Chrome, but we'll send it out and we'll, we'll resolve it. But thank you very much for that. Um, one question, another question, sorry, is, is there any financial help for a diagnostic assessment? I know you touched on this, but before a student makes the transition to higher education. Unfortunately, there isn't. If, if they, and unless they, they apply for private funding like the Snowden Trust, but I mean, a lot of it, a lot of the fund, funding available is for when they are in their course, but it's always worth asking any organization um, the BDA, the diagnostic assessment can be quite expensive, but it, it's, it's almost an investment if it's manageable, because it means that all the support can be in place for when the student begins their course. So they're not waiting for a tutor, they're not waiting for a mentor, they're not waiting for the equipment to come through and the assistive software or the training, it, it's ready there for them. In fact, it, it can be delivered in time for them to begin practicing. So they're they're literally confident in using it. Uh, so if it's affordable, uh, it's worth it. But again, there are different fees on, on the market for whether it's a full educational psychologist report or for when it's a specialist teacher. There has been a change in the diagnostic assessment process that, that SFB were obliged to find some way of measuring the needs of somebody with this uh, specific learning difficulty with the pandemic going on with no face to face and everything being remote and there was no diagnostic assessment available remotely uh, because it involves face to face and hands on testing psychometric testing but they did consider this and they did bring in something called the evaluation of needs which sask did approve and SASC is, is I've got, I have to always write out the specific learning difficulty assessment standards committee. They did approve this evaluation of needs, which was considerably less. Now that had been stopped. It's been reviewed, renewed, reviewed and renewed. And the latest news is that it's been extended to, I think is at the end of June or July. I, I can check that for you. After that date, evaluation of needs will no longer be accepted, but a full diagnostic assessment has been put together, compiled by SASC and approved by SASC to be given remotely. And that, that obviously is, is, is a huge bonus, but again, different, different practitioners charge a different fee. So it's, it's quite an open market. Um, we're happy to advise. We work with quite a few diagnosticians locally so we're more than happy to to help you with that thank you i think that's a brilliant offer that people can come to if they do have questions regarding that um there's one more question at the moment which is uh, will you be able to carry out school visits possibly later in the year to a small targeted group and this is asking from someone from a local sixth form and i've got to say i've heard this question from a few of our partner schools as well is mm -hmm. that especially for maybe things like parents evenings or yeah similar events yeah we, we definitely we do visit schools and we and sometimes it's a sixth form assembly sometimes it's a parents evening an open day or or it's it just suits the school they can organize an evening um, where we go along and give a presentation and a talk answer questions and it's a variety, variety of people in the audience the students the parents the tutors so we're actually open to whatever suits the school it can be a remote webinar if, if they really would prefer that just for parents or just for tutors so literally whatever suits the school and however we can reach the, the pupils making that transition or thinking about it and encourage them 
to look into the DSA and see what help they can get, what their worries are, what their concerns are, and what support is available. That's, that's what our major aim is, to encourage them to apply and find out about the support. So whatever the school needs, we're very happy to oblige. Brilliant, thank you, Norma. Um, are there any common or common, common problems or delays with the DSA applications and the process that people um, can avoid? <laughs> yeah, well, this is one of the reasons why, as I said, we do help with, with the DSA applications. They, there can be delays. For example, the medical evidence may not be accurate. It may not have a date. It, may, it, may, it just may be left open to a student awards officer saying it's insufficient. It doesn't, the diagnosis isn't sufficient. Um, it's not specific. So sometimes the medical evidence that's submitted, some of, some of it will be approved for funding and others won't. So we actually, I can go over to Emily with this one actually, because we do have a form that you discussed earlier, didn't you, Emily? Yeah, I think that's the most straightforward way to yes. do it, is to actually use the pro forma that has the criteria on it. Um, and then the doctor or other health professional he signs it. So just yes. literally puts the student's name, uh, date and signs it and the and the uh, diagnoses and then because you can get it can just literally say anxiety and depression with no other information mm. and if and then we may get a student come to us and say that they, they come with a letter that says anxiety and depression but it doesn't say how it affects the student day to day and mm. uh, if it's long term um, and so it doesn't get accepted. The and that causes a de delay yeah. because obviously they then say that they, they write back saying this is insufficient evidence so there's a couple of weeks there again we we follow it up help the student to um, get the, the the correct evidence resubmit that that goes through another so it can actually go into weeks and months of delay just by not having the evidence together and it's the same with the diagnostic assessment if it's if it's not if it hasn't been carried out by uh, a practitioner who's registered with SASC then, or, or has a, a practicing assessment certificate in APC, then it won't be accepted. Um, so the best thing is often to check with us. Then if, if we have your consent to have a look at the medical evidence and make sure it's, it's up to scratch, if you like, or it's what we know the Student Finance England will, will accept or any, any other funding body, that can cut out so much delay. So the more that we're involved in that initial process, the more we can ensure there is no delay. All right. So it's a bit like the passport being covered by the post office and they check so that it's not sent backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Only there's no fee involved. We just help and make sure it goes through. Okay. 